Sometimes it's hard to come to the understanding that our body will become mostly useless after we're dead. Aside from the worms, our whole purpose lives and dies with us. And despite our fantasies of some sort of long-lasting legacy, deep down we assume that that's pretty much it. And then there's Jeremy Bentham, who made sure that any student at the University College London can come on over and bask in the intellectual glory emanating from his displayed corpse. Today's video is sponsored by Blinkist. If you're like me, you probably have an ambitiously long list of books that you want to read. You probably also find yourself time and time again distracted and overwhelmed by so many different tasks and surprises that life throws your way that finishing this list looks pretty much impossible. Of course, some books I would like to spend the time to sit down and enjoy each page, but for others, I really just don't have the time. Thankfully, I recently found out about Blinkist, which condenses entire books into just 15 minutes of the most important highlights. Blinkist lets you save time, money, and learn new things faster than ever. Personally, I use Blinkist when I'm doing household chores. Right now I'm listening to Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his wife for a hat, and I'm learning so much about cognition, perception, and psychology in general. Blinkist has over 3,000 nonfiction books, 14 million active users, and lets you access all of your titles well offline. Now there's also shortcasts that condense popular podcasts to the heart of each episode. Click on the link below and the first 100 people will get unlimited access for one week to try it out. This is a 7 day trial that is completely free and that you can cancel at any time. You'll also get 25% off for a full membership. Born in 1748 in London, England, Jeremy Bentham was born into great wealth and great ideas. Whereas his dad was a deep believer in enlightened rationalism, his mum was incredibly superstitious. As a toddler, Bentham spent much of his time reading his father's multi-volume History of England and studying Latin. By the age of seven, he had learned to play the violin, and by twelve, he was sent to Oxford. Bentham's time in Oxford was not one of joy. Instead, he felt that Oxford was quite boring and largely acted as a seat of privilege and prejudice. Despite this, Bentham completed his bachelor's at 16 and his master's at 19. Afterwards, he trained as a lawyer. This too brought him great boredom and frustration as he felt that the English law was far too complex. Shortly before being called to the bar, Bentham had discovered what he called the utility principle in the writings on social utility by David Hume. This moment would entirely reshape Bentham's worldview, and he would no longer pursue law. In 1781, Bentham came up with the term utilitarian. He took great joy in making up new words, including many we use today, such as international. Supposedly, the word utilitarian emerged from a dream in which he was a guest at a country estate, acting as the leader of the cult of utilitarians. Much of his philosophy developed with his passion for science, this was evident in his constant experimenting and probably best represented in the Archbishop of York's account of finding Bentham, reading Montesquieu and evaporating urine to obtain phosphorus. In 1785, Bentham would join his brother Samuel in Russia and spend much of his time writing intensely. Reportedly, he would rise at 6 a.m. and work until 4 p.m. There he would devise the idea of the panopticon, an observational structure that allowed a small number of guards to watch a large number of prisoners. Originally, he had devised the Panopticon in the hopes that it would interest Catherine the Great. However, his idea would later entirely consume him. He would spend 20 years, lots of money and time, pursuing this idea of the Panopticon, guided by the idea that the more strictly we are watched, the better we behave. He explained his lack of success as the cause of some sort of large-scale conspiracy against the common good itself. This wouldn't stop Bentham from coming up with other interesting ideas. He would also develop a Frigidarium in 1793, an ice house that was useful for preserving food. He also suggested that the government should use conversation tubes to enhance communication. He would actually install one of his own conversation tubes in his house. What Bentham is best known for is probably his legacy at the University College London. Jeremy Bentham greatly valued education, and although he did not have direct involvement in the founding of UCL, he is credited as its spiritual founder. 
Bentham also believed that his body should be used after his death, specifically because he felt that preserving his presence as a great philosopher would inspire the thinkers of the future. Because of this request, UCL did in fact keep his skeleton and head in a wooden cabinet called the Auto Icon. Although it is not true that Bentham's head is present at every council meeting, it has made its appearance from time to time. In 2017, a DNA sample was obtained to determine whether or not Bentham had autism. Jeremy Bentham is widely considered to be the founding father of utilitarianism. In fact, Bentham was largely committed to the creation of a panomian, a complete utilitarian code of law that could be used by society. The fundamental axiom of utilitarianism is that it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. Bentham felt that human nature was ruled by two masters, pleasure and pain, and that what causes the greater pleasure and the least of pain is morally good. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to determine what we shall do. On the one hand, the standard of right and wrong. On the other, the chain of causes and effects are fastened to their throne. They govern us in all we do, in all we say, in all we think. According to Bentham, this pleasure and pain is both physical and spiritual, and can be measured through various elements such as intensity and duration. From this, he developed a hedonistic calculus to estimate the moral status behind any action. Some have argued against Bentham's philosophy, suggesting that it is too simplistic. Mill, another utilitarian, criticized Bentham's view of human nature for completely removing the concept of a conscience. Others have also argued that his theory lacks a principle of fairness or sense of justice. Technically, under Bentham's theory, actions such as torture would be justifiable if it led to the greatest happiness. Bentham also held the belief that society would be better off if there was no privacy. In fact, Bentham imagined a world that acted much like a gymnasium, where everything was noticed. This is evident in his view of the Panopticon, a structure in which everyone could be monitored at any time. Bentham personally believed that transparency would lead to some sort of utopia because it would increase trust and understanding. Despite his, by modern standards, naive beliefs with regards to human nature and privacy, Bentham was incredibly progressive for his time. He is considered to be one of the earliest proponents of animal rights. Specifically, he argued that the capacity for an entity to feel pain, rather than the capacity for reason, is what should determine what he called the insuperable line, which is what he uses to categorize which organisms are to be protected from suffering by the law. The question is not can they reason, nor can they talk but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? Furthermore, Bentham consistently argued for gender equality and was largely in favor of women's suffrage, as well as the ability for women to divorce and hold political office. He may have been one of the first advocates for LGBT rights, arguing for the liberalization of any laws against homosexual acts. According to Bentham, such acts were simply natural and irregularities of the venereal appetite. Much of Jeremy Bentham's thought has persisted in the policies and laws that make up our society to this day. His advocacy against suffering, belief in the greatest good, and attempts at quantifying morality are all certainly honorable pursuits. And on a more individual level, Bentham's absolute embrace of being himself, through his curiosity and his tendency to go against social customs, is something we could all appreciate. Perhaps we don't need to see his decaying corpse on display to feel his great influence, although this is something he would have certainly disagreed with.